Good evening and welcome in to the Horseshoe Huddle on Sports Illustrated podcast. I am your host, Deputy Editor at Horseshoe Huddle on Sports Illustrated, Josh Carney, joined tonight by our analyst, Andrew Moore. And Andrew, we have a lot to talk about. A lot has happened. So we're. <laughs> I just want to dive into it with you. Uh, I know that the viewers probably we just want to get into it as well. But uh, obviously, the Colts have made their final cuts to get down to 53. They have 15 men on the practice squad. You can keep 16 this year. Uh, there are still a handful of moves to come, but it has been a whirlwind. So before I get into your your main takeaway, I want to run down who the Colts have cut in case you know some of the, the viewers are, are, are missing a few things. But on Tuesday, the Colts waived quarterback Brett Hundley, running back Benny LeMay, running back Deion Jackson, tight end Farad Green, tight end... I'm going to butcher this name, Kahali Waring, who they just <laughs> claimed, which, you know, it's like that uh, that Simpsons gif, in and out, hat on the rack, in and out. Uh, offensive lineman Will Holden, defensive lineman Cameron Klein, linebacker Curtis Bolton, Shaw, safety Sean Davis, the rookie, and then they also released veteran defensive tackle Andrew Brown, veteran linebacker Malik Jefferson, and safety Ibrahim Campbell. They also placed Sam Tevy on injured reserve. Waved linebacker Isaiah Kalfusi, released offensive lineman Jake Elgin Camp, cornerback Holton Hill, and veteran safety Sean Davis. And then previously, you know what they had done, but uh, they got down to 53. <laughs> and then the moves continued to happen. Um, obviously, they traded for veteran offensive lineman Matt Pryor from the Eagles. They gave up, uh, I believe it was a 2022 sixth uh, for a seventh round pick and Matt Pryor. And then they put in some waiver claims today. Uh, They claimed to let me find it here so I don't butcher the names. But Zach is calling him Bo Pete. Uh, What is his last name? Keys, I'm pretty sure. Bo Bo Pete Keys, which I don't know where the Bo Pete is coming from, but we'll leave that to Zach. But Thakarius Keys, who they claimed from the Chiefs, and they also claimed rookie cornerback Chris Wilcox, a BYU product uh, from the Buccaneers today. In light of that, they ended up cutting two defensive backs that I think Colts fans have grown comfortable with, I think is a fair word. Uh, Andre Chikari and Marvell Tell III, which was both very surprising. So now all that's out of the way, Andrew. (laughs) Who? What was your biggest takeaway from from some of these roster moves? Um, For me, I I think it's how they handled the the Andre Chikari situation. We heard... Uh, from a couple of people that uh, the cuts happened as he was walking out onto the field for practice Wednesday, which that's just, it's not okay in my book. That's a whole nother topic, but um, just your general takeaway here from the moves that the Colts have made in the last 48 hours. I think the main takeaway is just, I mean, this, this roster is hard to make. It's not, it's not no longer, no names are going to be on this roster. We've gotten that core uh, of players that the Colts have, and they're really sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And, and, there really weren't too many surprises on cuts for me. Uh, I didn't think that I mean, when I wrote that piece that Marvell Toe could be a surprise cut candidate. He ended up being a surprise cut candidate just a day later than what I thought he was going to be. Uh, neither Davis really shined in camp, uh, especially in that final preseason game. The rookie Sean Davis, <laughs> he had a, a couple missed interceptions, numerous missed tackles. And and while the Colts really like his football IQ, I remember Chris mm-hmm. Ballard saying that, that Sean Davis kind of reminded him of Kari Willis when Kari Willis was a rookie, he the physical the physical ability just isn't there quite yet. So I think a good spot would be for him on the practice squad to kind of develop. Matt Eberflus said that he's a work in progress. So I think that's a good spot for him. Uh, I didn't expect Will Holden to be to be cut just because. Just because of the 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 issue with with Eric Fisher not quite there right. yet, the instability that that left tackle position has, you'd like to have another tackle, especially with Sam Tebby going down. And then shortly afterwards, the trade happens for Matt Pryor, and then it starts to make sense. So yeah. that that was probably the one that was the biggest surprise. Um, and then today for for Andre uh, Shashare. yeah, that that one was a surprise for me because he he was good in training camp. He was good in the preseason, and he had such position versatility, which the Colts really covet. I mean, he could play inside and outside corner. He can play sit at safety position, what he was listed as. And then he's he's a pretty good special teams player as well. So cutting him 
for for the two waiver claims and then Marvel Tell going. I think it was just the Colts wanted to see more and expected to see more out of Marvel Tell this year, and it just didn't happen. So I would say probably Tell and Holden were the two big ones for me. But other than that, it, it just kind of really shows the depth that this Colts team already has, and it's really hard to make this team. Yeah, you know, I was surprised that they put in waiver claims, first of all, especially for defensive backs. I mean, Bo Pete Keys has the, you know, all the traits that Chris Ballard and the Colts look for. He's long, physical, can play zone coverage. Uh, he, he he looks like a nice find and a stash, but I was surprised to see them not only put a waiver claim in, but do so knowing that they had to make additional moves uh, and, and to see – you know, some of the veterans off the roster. I think Marvell Tell, I think I was one of the few that was like, I just can't see it. Obviously, you wrote the piece saying that he could be a surprise cut. You know, our colleagues, Zach Hicks and Jake Arthur, uh, both were in the same camp with you. Like, it, it could happen. He hasn't done much. Still a surprise for me. Um, but I, I just, I'm surprised at all the wheeling and dealing and still what is to come with the Colts because you think about it, you have Zach Paschal, Carson Wentz, and Ryan Kelly on the COVID-19 list. I believe Eric Fisher is still on it. I don't I don't know if I saw that news, if he came off or not. So four guys on the COVID-19 list. Obviously, Fisher would then move to, I would assume, IR at that point. Um, and then you have T.Y. Hilton, who Chris Ballard today, you know, dropped the news that Hilton had surgery and will go on the IR, but it was a non-invasive minor surgery. So you could assume he's back week four on the road in Miami. But that opens up another roster spot. And then <laughs> you could put Sam Ellinger on IR, which I, I am I am firmly in the camp of just stash him on IR the rest of the year. I feel bad that you're going to do that to the young kid, but I think you've seen enough to know that, okay, he got his taste. He did well in some preseason action. He got a lot of reps in training camp. Let's let's stash him, and then we'll see where he's at in 2022. That's just to me to be able to keep him and – and make sure that Brett Hundley can be on the roster because of all the COVID issues with the Colts that I don't really want to touch. And I know you don't want to as well either at this point, but for now that the 53 man roster is set, what, what position group do you think is the strength of this Colts team right now based off of the, and I'm going to use air quotes, the final 53 man roster, because we are seeing right now just how final that is. I think I think when you start out, we're, we're, I'm going to take all the injuries into account here as well. But yeah. the uh, a group that's surprisingly healthy is the running back group. I mean, Jonathan Taylor hasn't played a single snap all preseason. That was by design. Yep. Save that kid for the regular season for him to do damage. Uh, Naheem Hines was a little bit banged up in training camp, but he's worked through that and he's good to go now. Marlon Mack has come back and hasn't had any complications from his torn Achilles. So he, I think I don't think I don't think he'll be used as much as as we might have thought previously. But he'll right. definitely come in and spell Jonathan Taylor at times and and be used in multiple situations. And then Jordan Wilkins, the the guy just continues to to fight off any undrafted free agent that tries to take his spot yeah. and stays on this roster. Jordan Wilkins still for his career averages five yards a carry. He's going to come in here when when the Colts need him. He's going to produce and he. He plays special teams as well. So I think if you're talking, taking all the injuries into account, the running back group on offense is probably the strongest group. And then when you're looking at, at the defensive side, it's hard not to look at, at, at maybe a tie right now at the defensive line and the linebacker group. The linebacker group has, I mean, you've got all pro talent in Darius Leonard. Bobby Okariki was probably the star of training camp, I would say. he had, It seemed like every, play, every practice – he was making a play and coming up with a turnover. And that's huge because that's that's one of the things I wanted to see from Bobby Okariki is there were so many times where he just he was out there in the right spot to make the play and he just just didn't execute. And now we're starting to see that execution. And then you're, we're starting to see this defensive line all come together. I mean, DeForest Buckner is a defensive player of the year candidate. Grover Stewart could be looking at possible Pro Bowl nomination. And then you you have to I've just I've just been so enamored with what I've seen from Quiddy Pay 
over yeah. these past couple preseason games. The kid's only played two quarters, but he's got two sacks. He's got a forced fumble. He's got multiple tackles for loss and multiple run stops. Again, we're not going up against starters. We're not game planning here, but but it's encouraging to see that, especially when the Colts are pretty much basically changing the entire way he's played the game of football at Michigan. They're putting him out wide. They're just telling him to go get the, go get the quarterback. It, it's very promising to see. So I, I really think this defense, while there might be some questions at third corner there there might be some questions at maybe the left defensive end spot how they sort out that rotation with Taekwon Lewis, Kamoko Ture and the like this defense can be elite and I really believe that just because of all the pieces they have and and how this how this group has looked not only in the preseason but in training camp they've looked very very stout and I know that Colts defense wants to be respected more and I think they're on a mission to go out and do that this year. Where do you think this defense ranks in terms of the rest of the NFL? Do you think they're borderline top five or are they, I know the last time Zach Hicks and I were on the pod, we, we said they were in that eight, nine, 10 range. Where, where do you come in on this, this defense to start the year? And where do you think they could truly finish barring health? I think right now I would say they're top 10. I do agree with that just because there are some question marks on this mm-hmm. defense. I mean, that other outside corner spot, Rocky Sins there now. Will TJ Carey take it from him? But then in that first preseason game, TJ Carey gave up a 60 yard play. So there's still quite a bit of question marks for that outside corner. Quiddy Pay is still a rookie. I mean, we've seen the flashes, but I want to see him produce it on, on Sundays. And, and then just just what happens as far as health goes. But I think I think if this defense can stay healthy, if we can see Quiddy Pay come into his own. There's really two, and besides that outside corner spot, there's not very many question marks on this team. And I think the way this defense prioritizes turnovers, if they can get close to that 30, I know they they shoot for 40, but even if they get 30 to to 35 turnovers somewhere in that range, they're easily going to be a top five defense in this league. And and I think Matt Eberflus, and that's what this this Colts defense is really striving to be, a feared defense and, and, and a unit that the Colts can rely on to win games any given Sunday. Do you think so? I wrote a piece, I think it was late last week, about DeForest Buckner and, and mm-hmm. getting some defensive player of the year love. Do you think it's realistic with him? I mean, I'm not knocking the talent whatsoever, but you take into account that it a large portion of it, whether we like it or not, is a popularity contest. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think it's possible in Indianapolis with a Colts franchise that kind of stays out of the spotlight? Um, unless it seems to be for negative reasons lately. Do you think being in Indianapolis, being an interior defensive lineman, not named Aaron Donald, do you think he has a realistic shot at defensive player of the year? Or is it just this is the year where he starts to get some of that recognition as the face of that Colts defense, even more so than Darius Leonard? I really do. And and I think it's a I think it's multiple things that play a role in this. I think with like what you said, how he's gonna start getting recognition, I think he started to finally do that last year. I yeah. mean, when he made his first all pro team. People are aware of DeForest Buckner now. They know how great of a player he is. And and I think a lot of people forget he still put up ten, almost ten sacks, nine and a half sacks, and he was playing on a bum ankle. For the, and he missed for the a last, game. And he missed a game for the last third of the year. So a fully healthy DeForest Buckner. And then when you have Grover Stewart kind of take that next step where people on the in, those offensive linemen on the interior can't just focus on Buckner, they have to focus on Stewart too. If he can get help on the outside with Quiddy Pay becoming a legitimate threat, you're, it's going to take the, the, the attention away from DeForest Buckner and he can go up there and make plays. And another thing that helps, I mean, the Colts haven't really had too many primetime games. They yeah. got... They got four this year. Yeah. So they've got plenty of primetime games, plenty of chances for DeForest Buckner to show in front of a national audience that he can dominate games. Things that, yeah. that us us people here in Indiana or people that follow the Colts, we know happens on a daily basis. So I think he really does have an opportunity, whether he's going to actually be in that conversation or we'll have to see, but he, the opportunity is there. And I certainly think he is, he is the type of player and at the level of player that, that, that he could firmly put himself in that conversation yeah i want to go back to a point you made earlier about the running backs and jordan wilkins uh i seem to have come off as a jordan wilkins hater because i've been trying to (laughs) trade him which i just i'm looking at roster construction and 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 future asset management uh i love jordan wilkins Mm -hmm. i've said before i think with you uh I, i think if he weren't 
with the Colts, he would be a starting running back in more than half of the teams in the NFL. He's that good. Uh, but yes, he did hold off undrafted rookie challengers once again and held down the number four job. Um, I- I'm curious from your vantage point, how do you think they're going to the, you know, shake out the carries this year? Obviously, Taylor's going to be your main running back, but you're going to want to get Marlon Mack work. You're going to want to get Naeem Hines work on the ground, whether that's in third down or out of shotgun or whatever it may be. But how does Wilkins, you know, maintain some value and, and not only prove himself again this year, but prove himself to teams that could be watching in a year where he's going to, you know, enter his free agency uh, come March. How, how, how does the, how do the carries shake out, Andrew? I honestly think, and and I at first when camp started, this was not my thinking. I thought that they were kind of pretty much ride the hot hand like last year, and it was going to be divided up pretty evenly. It seems now, just with how Jonathan Taylor, not only how he's looked in preseason or in training camp, I should say, in those practices, but how they're protecting him during these preseason games, I really think the Colts are going to rely heavily on Jonathan Taylor. I think what they realized last year and, and what I was – clamoring for all year is the more carries that Jonathan Taylor gets the better he gets going he's a back that doesn't start out very fast but he wears that defense down and then by the end of the game he's getting chunk plays of 10 to 15 yards every time he touches the ball I think the Colts realize that they realize that Jonathan Taylor is a guy that that gets better as the game goes along and if he becomes that workhorse we're going to reap the full benefits that JT has and now I think I think Naheem Hines will also be a bigger part of this offense Frank Reich even said it they looked back at the tape last year. They wondered, how did we not have this guy more involved? I think Naheem Hines will be a bigger presence in the passing game, even catching 63 passes last year. He's going to come in, and, and they're going to want to make him a vocal part of vocal part of that offense, especially with, with wanting to get the ball out of Carson Wentz's hands pretty quickly. Yep. And then as far as Jordan Wilkins is concerned, I still think he'll get some run. I don't know if it'll be as much as he did last year, considering Marlon Mack is back, and, and I think Marlon Mack will take a, a majority of those carries carries but but you you know this as much as I do the the running back position in the NFL is so fluid and it's it's filled with guys can get injured at any moment so it's it's bound to happen that one of these guys is going to go down and miss a game or two and that's when Jordan Wilkins is going to shine he's going to come in with that as that change of pace back and he's just going to consistently get you five yards a carry and pick up first downs and help you continue to extend drives. And I really think that's what, that's where his focus needs to be this year is just staying ready because you never know when an injury is going to happen to one of these running backs and he's got to be ready to go in and produce at a high level because you're absolutely right. It's, it's going to be tough for the Colts to keep him next year just because of, of what he's done. He's ready for a breakout role and a bigger role. And the Colts are just, aren't going to be able to give that to him uh, moving forward. Before we jump into breaking down position by position on the, the again, 53-man roster, uh, I just want to do a quick plug for our social. Uh, for those watching, you can continue to watch us live on YouTube at Horseshoe Huddle and on Facebook at Horseshoe Huddle. Please follow us on Twitter at SI underscore Colts. You can also check us out at, at Colt Maven. We do have two Sports Illustrated uh, affiliated Twitter accounts. Andrew can be found on Twitter at Andrew SI. Uh, and we are very pleased to announce he is coming on full time with us. So the uh, the training wheels have been taken off. He's done an awesome <laughs> job this summer and just a real asset to this team. So we are thrilled to have him. You can follow me at by Josh Carney. Check us out. Uh, also, the, the podcast Horseshoe Guys on Twitter at Horseshoe Guys. And you can search us anywhere you get your podcast. Uh, Horseshoe Guys, you can find us there. We may have some news on that here in the future as well. Uh, in terms of an addition uh, that features the man next to me on the screen. So let's dive into this here, Andrew. Let's look at the quarterback position. Okay, we're just going to rattle these off quickly. But on the 53-man roster currently, there's just two, Sam Ellinger (laughs) and Jacob Eason. Eason is the, I would say, the presumed starter because we don't know what's happening with Carson Wentz at this point. However, Carson Wentz, as we mentioned earlier, is on the COVID-19 reserve list. So something will have to happen there. What people seem to be forgetting is Sam Ellinger is hurt. Five to six weeks with a sprained ACL, which I'm not a doctor. I don't think you are either, Andrew. So if you are, (laughs) and I'm stepping on your toes here, I apologize. But a sprain is a tear of some sort. So he's got a slight tear 
in his ACL. For me, I would just I would put him on IR, put him on ice, get your knee fixed. But it doesn't feel like that's what the Colts are going to do. They're going to let him rehab, come back, and, and develop him. But right now with the way the roster looks, Andrew, I'm a bit concerned about the quarterback room just because, look, however you want to feel about the vaccine, we know Carson Wentz isn't vaccinated. You know, that's a big reason why he's on the reserve list right now. He didn't test positive, but he was close contact. He's shelved for, I think, 10 days because he's unvaccinated. I think it's, I think it's five as a close contact. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> okay. So regardless, he's on the shelf. He's missing valuable mm, practice right. time. Uh, you know, Jacob Eason got a ton of time in preseason, looked good, looked bad, looked indifferent at times. Uh, and then obviously Brett Hundley's on the practice squad, which we'll touch on later. But for me, I feel a little concerned about quarterback. What about you? It definitely definitely is unsettling because just because Carson Wentz is unvaccinated, I mean, that's going to have ramifications if he does end up testing positive for COVID or he's a close contact again. And, and that's why I think – I don't know if there's really a veteran option out there. I mean, I, I hear a lot of Colts fans saying, well, maybe we should look at Cam Newton. I can tell you that's not going to happen. Absolutely not going to happen in the Indianapolis. No. But, but and that's the, that's that, that could be playing – a role into why they might want to keep Sam Ellinger, uh, put him on IR, and then once he is ready to return, to kind of take him off and keep three quarterbacks on that active roster. Uh, because we we know Jacob Eason is fully vaccinated, so mm-hmm. so that is good. So so we know that that he if he is a close contact, as long as he tests negative, he can come back. So that's why I think. But once Sam Ellinger and and I think the Colts, if if Sam Ellinger really did need surgery, the, the way they've been going this this season already, this preseason with with injuries, if there's any chance that surgery is going to help out, they've they've been erring on the side of caution and, and getting that surgery done. So if they think that rehab is is good for Sam Ellinger and and that he doesn't need that surgery, then I think we can trust that. And I yeah. think if he comes back after five or six weeks, there's no need, again, to rush him back. Right. He's not going to be playing unless both go, quarterbacks go down. Just just take your time with him, but I think he still will be on the, on the roster once he is available to return. Um, and then Brett Hundley will stay on the practice squad. I, I do think with the new, um, you know, the new bylaw put into the CBA back in 2018 with the, the IR change where you can do the reserve IR, meaning you can come back at any point in the season. Um, I, I, do, I do think the Colts will take advantage of that and put Ellinger on IR. He'll miss a minimum of three games, which again, his timeline was five to six weeks. I do think they will elevate Brett Hundley before the week one game against mm-hmm. the Seattle Seahawks, just because in these COVID times, you never know what's going to happen a quarterback and mm-hmm. you can't have a Denver Broncos situation with Kendall Hinton right. at, at quarterback. I am curious though, and I'm just spitballing here. If it makes sense for them to bring back Jalen Morton on the practice squad, if they do that with Hundley, just to get a guy back in this, in the room, in the facility that knows the system, knows the guys he can just kind of be a body and, and kept around just in case. So that's just me spitballing. There's, I'm not speculating that's going to happen. I'm just saying I wonder if that makes sense. He's not a veteran presence. I think he's a second-year quarterback, but he knows the system. He's been in the room. He knows the coaches. So that, that's one to keep an eye on. Um, I'm not going to run down running backs again in depth, but again, you know, on the roster, Jonathan Taylor, Naeem Hines, Marlon Mack, Jordan Wilkins. Wide receiver gets a little interesting because obviously – the T.Y. Hilton news today is tough to swallow because he's hurt again. Now, caveat with that, he's only missed 10 games in nine years. Like, he's not an injury-prone receiver, in my opinion. Um, but he's hurt. He's going to go on IR, according to Chris Ballard, during his press conference today. Uh, so that leaves some question marks at receiver. Obviously, that elevates Michael Pittman Jr. into the number one role. Zach Pascal is on the COVID-19 reserve list, so technically not on the 53 at this point. Paris Campbell, you want to talk about health, barring health, you know, he <laughs> he's probably your number two at this point. Then you've got guys like Mike Strawn, Desmond Patman, and Ashton Doolin on the 53-man roster. Kiki QT, I, there was that report out there that they signed him, but apparently there's a lot of, you know, hoops that they got to jump through to make it happen. I wonder if once... T.Y. Hilton lands on IR, that Kiki Cutie, the known Colts killer, uh, lands 
on the 53 outright. Um, that's where I'm a little confused because, you know, there was that report out there. They signed him. Um, you know, I think it was Jim Aiello who said, you know, cutie's a Colt, but we're not seeing him on the practice squad. And he's clearly not on the 53. And we haven't heard anything officially on T.Y. Hilton going to IR. So receiver, I'm a, a tiny bit concerned with knowing Hilton's going to be on the shelf for at least three weeks. Pascal's on the COVID-19 <laughs> list. You've got a second year receiver as your number one. A second-year receiver is probably your number three. A guy who can't stay healthy in Paris Hilton for all the talent in the world is, is profiling as your number two at this point. I, much like quarterback, I'm a little concerned about receiver right now, Andrew. Talk me off the ledge. I think it's just time for the young guys to step up. And I wrote yeah. a piece of on this earlier in the week. I mean, Michael Pittman Jr. all offseason when they've asked, I mean, you're you're ready to take this leap. Do you want to be that one guy? And he's he's embraced it. He's like, Yeah, I want that pressure. We and the way he's been killing it all training camp, I mean, you have to be excited about what Michael Pittman brings to the to the table. Zach Pascal, Zach Pascal should be off the COVID list here in a day or two. And I think I think he's the guy that's most impacted by T. Y. Hilton going down because Zach Pascal's the dude everything wide receiver i think he's going to get more reps in the passing game now that ty is is down and, and then paris campbell paris campbell knock on wood has had the his healthiest training camp uh in, in the since he entered the league in 2019 yeah he he got through with without any injuries he had a couple days where he was sick but that's about it and and i think we saw last year just how much Frank Reich likes Paris Campbell and what he wants to do with Paris Campbell. Starting with that that week one game against the Jaguars, Paris Campbell was all over the field, and the Colts were trying to get him the ball and get it in his hands to make plays. And then, obviously, the the Vikings game happens. He gets hit on the knee and misses the rest of the year. But Frank Reich's really high on Paris Campbell. And I think Paris Campbell can have a vital role in this offense as, as long as he can stay healthy. And, and that's just what we need to see. And until he can do it through a 17-game season now, we have to be a little bit little bit concerned. And then I, I do like that theory, though, that, that is if when Hilton goes on IR, and, and it doesn't sound like he's going to miss that as much time as we had originally thought. Because you know Chris Ballard. He gives it to you straight. He doesn't try to sugarcoat things. He doesn't try to lead you astray. He said he's going to be back sooner rather than later. The right. surgery, like you said, was, wasn't was invasive. And as soon as it was a minor procedure, as soon as it happened, it was instant relief, he said, to T.Y. Hilton. So he should be on the mend. And T.Y. Hilton's a fast healer. Like you said, he's only missed 10 games in his career. But those 10 games have been bad. The Colts are, are I think, 11 games. The, the Colts are one in 10 when T.Y. Hilton doesn't play. Not good. So, <laughs> so exactly. So we're going to need to see these wide receivers step up. Now, do I think Michael Strawn is going to bit play a big role? I really don't think so. Their Colts are going to bring him along slowly. Desmond Patman himself might go on IR with his foot injury and Ashton Doolin will be used sparingly, mostly on special teams. It's really going to be up to for the wide receiver group, Paris Campbell, Michael Pittman Jr. and Zach Pascal to carry the load until T Y Hilton can return. Yeah. And you know, if, if, Kiki Cutie is the ad once T.Y. Hilton goes on IR. Week four, ahead of week four, you're going to have a real roster crunch. Assuming Desmond Patman doesn't go on IR, maybe that's the spot where he does and just kind of tries to tough it out for three weeks with the foot injury. But, I mean, you've got six receivers on the roster now. I don't think they want to risk waving Michael Strawn in the middle of the season. Uh, you, you don't want to risk – I don't think you want to risk waving Desmond Patman for all that you've invested in his development at this point. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a numbers crunch. And then <laughs> I don't think you're going to cut Kiki cutie after three weeks. Cause I think once he comes in, he's going to be a decent size, uh, leader to the offense, uh, at least out of the slot with Campbell. So it's interesting, you know, the guy I circle there is Ashton Doolin, but he reminds me so much of, of new England Patriots. Great Matthew Slater. Like mm -hmm. you can't cut that guy. He's so He's so important on special teams. And I know people are like, well, if you don't do anything at receiver on offense, like what's the point? Like, you know, as well as I know, and I, I mean, your, your podcast name, the educated fan plays right into this. Like, you know, damn well, just like I know special teams is so important. It's so important. And Ashton Doolin is a key piece to this team, in my opinion. And 
I don't. I I just I'm going on a rant here, but I don't like the way some fans just want to cast him to the side and say don't need him. You know, he doesn't do anything offensively. He's not on the team for his receiving skills. So right. there's a there's a real numbers crunch coming there, and that's why Chris Ballard's paid the big bucks, and we sit here and <laughs> analyze it. So right. Uh, I want to move on to tight end. Uh, obviously, three: Jack Doyle, Mo Ali Cox, Kylan Granson. Uh, nothing's going to move there. I'm glad for Rod Green landed on the practice squad. I think there's a clear one, two, three in terms of snaps. And our friend on Facebook, Kyle Stewart, chimed in earlier on the receivers conversation. Young guys got to step up. But again, with Hilton out, it does fall a little bit on Jack Doyle and Mo Ali Cox. So, uh, yeah, Kyle, I think uh, Andrew and I are both in agreement with you. Uh, I think Jack Doyle is going to have a much better year this year than what he had last year. Uh, especially early on with T.Y. out and probably with Carson Wentz, hopefully under center and needing a security blanket. Moving to the offensive line, it gets a little questionable, especially at left tackle, Andrew. We knew that coming in. We knew that with Sam Tevy going down with a torn ACL. Uh, slight addition by subtraction. He was really bad this summer, period. Mm -hmm. um, Will Holden was a surprise cut, but you know we've talked in Slack groups with Jake and, and Zach. He's just not very good. Um, he's probably better suited for inside, but they've got a ton of depth inside. Right. So Julian Davenport is the projected starter at left tackle. And then obviously, you know, Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly's on COVID-19 reserve list, but he'll be back. Uh, Mark Lewinsky and Braden Smith is your starting unit. Depth is a little bit of concern. I think that's why uh, Chris Ballard made the move to go get Matt Pryor. Now you can debate, is that good enough depth? I don't think so, but he's experienced and he's versatile. So I can see why they like him. Um, obviously you've got Chris Reed is back. Danny Pinter is back and our guy, Will Fries made the 53 man. So I feel good about depth overall on the offensive line. I mean, I think I said this earlier in the week in the Slack group, having a guy like Chris Reed as your backup at left guard is like having a six starter. Like that guy could start mm -hmm. anywhere in the league, in my opinion. Um, so having him is huge. Danny Pinter took a step forward this year. Will Fries can play any position. Legitimately, this isn't, you know, hyperbole. He can play any position on the offensive line in a pinch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, Matt Pryor has that that versatility as well. So I, I feel good about the offensive line. How about you? I really do. And I think I think it kind of shows that the, the Colts really think Eric Fisher is close to returning because yeah. they, they haven't made, they, especially cutting Will Holden, bringing in Matt Pryor, who really isn't seen as a starter. Julian Davenport, the way he's he's performed lately, I think he can hold it down. Now, what we need to see, though, is we're probably going to see Jack Doyle and Mo Ali Cox line up next to Julian Davenport a lot th through the first couple weeks of the season, however long he's in there, just to provide that extra chip and before they go out on their route or help, help support in the running game. So that way they can make up for that. But but the Colts are, are they really like where Eric Fisher is. And I don't and I think if he didn't test positive for COVID, we would start to see him kind of in these practice situations this week. Yeah. I don't think he now he plays week one. I'm still iffy on week two, but week three against Tennessee is kind of what I'm looking at is possibly where Eric Fisher could return. And if the Colts don't place him on IR when he comes off the COVID list, then, then you know there's a chance for him to play against Tennessee. Otherwise, they would have just put him on IR and he'd miss those three games. So yeah. I think Eric Fisher is close to returning. And then when he does, again, this is going to be a top three offensive line group in the NFL. Because, I, I mean, you could probably replace Eric Fisher and Anthony Costanzo. They're about the same the same level a uh, wash, yeah yeah pretty much a wash so and the other guys i mean you got an all pro a pro bowler of a top a solid starter and then a borderline pro bowler and braden smith so yeah. again this this colts offensive line is going to be fine we just kind of need to get through these injuries to see what they're what they're all about and then they need if they're not vaccinated follow the protocols and and hopefully you don't get put on the list that's yeah. that's what it's going to that's what it's going to come down to yeah, I, I know some people are probably screaming listening to this right now. Like, stop talking about the vaccine. But, like, it's going to be an issue for every, you know, all 32 teams. It's not mm -hmm. just the Colts, regardless of your stance on it. Like, it's going to affect teams on Sundays. Uh, but, yeah, you mentioned this offensive line. Uh, Brandon Thorne of Trench Warfare is, like, the gospel when it comes to offensive line play. And uh, he recently did top 15 lists at all positions across the offensive line. Unsurprisingly, Colts didn't have anybody in top 15 at left tackle, but 
Quentin Nelson was his top left guard. I think Ryan Kelly was top 10 center. Mark Lewinsky was was borderline top 15. I think he was 14 or 15 at right guard, which it feels about right. And, and Braden Smith, I think, was top six. So, yeah, this is a loaded group, and they should be because there's a lot of money invested up front. But the mm-hmm. good news about Eric Fisher is that he wasn't placed on PUP before final cuts, meaning he's he, he's close, like you mentioned. So I could see them putting him on IR just – to to free up that roster spot for a few weeks and kind of let Chris Ballard, you know, see where the chips are and and, and play them as they come. Um, but yeah, he's close, and I, I don't think it's a back in week seven or week eight. I think I think it's a back in week four or week five. So uh, and that's that's great news. That's that's absolutely fantastic news. And kudos to Modern Medicine because that's usually a twelve to thirteen month recovery. And we're talking about a guy who tore his ACL in the end of January playing in early October, which is just mm-hmm. absolutely wild to me. Um, so that's that's awesome. I did want to just mention one thing, though. I still find it very interesting that Braden Smith is listed as tackle and guard on the Colts website. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's foreshadowing or what, but it's it just – year after year it's like yeah tackle and guard it's like he's he's right tackle so <laughs> <laughs> it's just he's got he has the option to play right guard if the colts absolutely need him to but i never see a situation where they're going to yeah. move him over to right guard no so let's move to the other side of the ball in the trenches uh they kept a lot of names now there was speculation along the defensive line that Tyquan lewis was dealing with something from jason spears of uh for the culture and, and kudos to him for breaking the ty hilton news it's great that uh, someone that's not part of the big media, um, you know, can make his bark like that. So kudos to Jason. But uh, Tyquan Lewis made the 53-man roster. Antoine Woods, Chris Williams, summer sensation, uh, mm-hmm. made the 53. Grover Stewart, Taylor Stallworth, DeForest Buckner, Kamoko Toure, Isaac Rochelle, Quiddy Pay, Al Quadin Muhammad, and Ben Banigou. A lot of names there. A couple I'm surprised made it specifically. Rochelle um, and Stallworth. I had I had Stallworth off the roster for Andrew Brown, and I believe I had Rochelle off um, for Muhammad, who did make it. But uh, yeah, I I feel really really good about this group overall. I know there were a ton of questions coming into the year about you know specifically defensive end losing Justin Houston, Danico Autry. You know your, your headliner was a rookie in Quiddy Pay, and you're counting on two guys that haven't really put it together uh, in Kamoko Toure and uh, Ben Banigou, but I think this has just been a masterful, masterful job uh, by the Colts rebuilding on the fly. Um, Coach Baker has done an awesome job developing these guys, and I think you touched on it earlier. Like, If the Colts are going to be a top five defense, it's going to be because of these guys here. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think – I think what we've seen in the preseason as well, I mean, it's it's kind of what, what the Colts brass has seen in the preseason. They're, they kept 11 guys on this defensive line. That's a lot of roster space that you're putting in one position group. So you you see you see guys like like Quiddy Pay, DeForest Buckter, Grover Stewart, and, and Tyquan Lewis. That's going to be your starting four. You have to feel good about that, especially if Tyquan Lewis can build on what he was able to do last year. Yeah, he's ha- he's been banged up with a shoulder injury. He did return to practice today, which is a good sign. Gives him possibly two full weeks to go before the, the opener of practice and getting back into the swing of things. And then the situational pass rushers in Kamoko Ture and, and Ben Banigou. Both of them have had phenomenal training camps, and, yeah. and I think they're ready to show that they're putting it all together. I mean, yeah. we, we thought Kamoko Ture was putting it all together in 2019 before that horrific ankle injury. Now he's fully healthy and can start to build upon that. And then in the middle, Antoine Woods is a good backup nose tackle when he gets gets fully healthy from his hamstring injury. Mm-hmm. I also had Andrew Brown making the roster because I thought out of the – He was incredible. Of, yeah, he had a great preseason, and I thought he was a very good three technique to back up Buckner. He's now on the practice squad. Taylor Stallworth is is in there. Um, and, I, and I think maybe the Colts might think about using Isaac Rochelle more inside too because he is a bigger body defensive yeah. end that you could put in there and possibly rush at the three technique. But overall, this defensive line, it's young. It, it's 
it's hungry. And, and I, I know the when the first time I was on with you here, I said my prediction for this Colts defensive line was probably 25 to 30 sacks. I'm going to up that a little bit. I think they can right. pass, surpass the 30 mark in the sacks and between 30 and 35. And it's not just going to be the, the pure sack numbers. We need to see constant pressure from this defensive line because the Colts had decent sack numbers last year, but there were still way too many times where no pressure happened. Yeah. Quarterback stood back there and had all day to throw. So that's going to be key. Keep those sack numbers up, but also generate pressure to make the quarterback uncomfortable. I know you you and I have talked about it. Myself and Zach have talked about it. I need to see a NASCAR package this year. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I need to see it. Uh, whether that's, you know, Banigou and Pay off the edge with, uh, you know, Tyquan Lewis and DeForest Buckner in the middle, or put whoever, put your four best pass rushers out there in obvious passing situation in a NASCAR package, turn them loose. That's what I want to see. They have the depth. They have the talent to do it. This quietly and quickly, Andrew, went from a major question mark to, I think, one of the strengths of the team. And, and uh, it's it's a testament to Coach Baker. It's a testament to Chris Ballard and the, his, his ability to identify talent. Uh, I think this is a real building block group moving forward. Uh, so I want to I want to slide back on the defense a little bit. Just go to linebacker. Nothing shocking whatsoever. I think this this was pretty much chalk throughout the summer for us on our fifty three men rosters until the very end because I, I cut Matthew Adams and uh, never say die Matthew Adams. He stuck around. <laughs> so uh, Matthew Adams made the fifty three man roster as did Zaire Franklin, Jordan Glasgow, Darius Leonard, Bobby Okariki, and EJ Speed. So those are your linebackers. Nothing surprising there whatsoever. Um, I think the only question still remains is who's going to be that third starter um, with Leonard and Okariki when the Colts are in base. I still think it's going to be Zaire Franklin, but I know that EJ Speed fits exactly what Chris Ballard loves in a linebacker and what Matt Eberflus is looking for uh, in that defense. But uh, yeah, you feel good about it. Uh, you know, the only question mark when it comes to seeing the field for defensive snaps is Jordan Glasgow. Um, just from the sense that he hasn't done it. And when he did do it at Michigan, he wasn't very, it wasn't great. Uh, but he's a special teams ace, kind of like Ashton Doolin. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I feel good about it. Um, you know, it's a solid group. It still hurts to look at that group and not see an Anthony Walker. Um, but overall, it, I don't have any qualms with it. What about you? Yeah, I think it's a solid group. I mean, Darius Leonard and Bobby Okereke, he had the chance to be one of the best tandems at linebacker that the Colts have, have ever seen, really. And, and, and you're going to miss that that leadership that Anthony Walker brings. But, I mean, that's Darius Leonard and Bobby Okereke. It's time for them to step up, take a more vocal leadership role in the locker room like Anthony Walker had. But but I think Bobby Okereke surpassed Anthony Walker last year in terms of his ability on the field, and I think it was the right move. Uh, I, I still do think that Zaire Franklin is probably going to be that starting Sam linebacker EJ Speed working his way back from injury, but and I know you're a Zaire Franklin guy. He he just has when when you're in the three linebacker personnel, it's pretty much for run stopping. And Zaire Franklin is a better run stopper in my opinion than EJ Speed. And then you're you're right on Jordan Glasgow. I mean, he wasn't drafted to play linebacker for the Colts. He no. was drafted strictly to be a special teams Pro Bowler, and that's what Chris Ballard said he has the potential to be, and and that's why he's on this team. And that's what you know. Kyle Stewart chimes in here again. He sees you know. Matthew Adams, the same as Ashton Doolin, hard to cut because of special teams play. Mm -hmm. I hear you, Kyle. I understand that. But I think that's what Jordan Glasgow is. So I think you're kind of losing a little bit having two special teams linebackers uh, there rather than, you know, your special teams ace. Uh, but again, Matthew Adams can play defensive snaps. He's he's shown he can play the run. He's a sound tackler coming downhill in base situations. But uh, I think that's – I honestly think that's Ashton Doolin – or not Ashton Doolin, Jordan Glasgow's role uh, moving forward. That's why he was drafted, and, and, and you know, that's, that's his role overall. Uh, but, yeah, I think we're on the same page with this group. I think we'll differ a little bit here moving to cornerbacks because there's just so many balls up in the air at this point. Mm -hmm. I, like, I, it's, it's been a wild few days here. So on the 53 as we speak, TJ Carey. Bo Pete Keys, Kenny Moore the second, Xavier Rhodes, Isaiah Rogers, Chris Wilcox, and Rocky Sin. The Colts still have Marvell Tell listed, which is uh, a little surprising because he was technically cut. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's still really hard for me to fathom that they liked Wilcox and Bo Pete Keys that much 
that they spent two early waiver claims on them and got rid of guys that they know in in Marvel Tell and uh, and uh, Andre uh, Chasseri. So it, it, it's 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 tough. I feel a, a I'm a little bit worried about depth considering TJ Carey's banged up, didn't look great in the preseason. Um, you know, you lose a, you lose a versatile piece like Marvell Tell uh, back there, and then you bring in these two unknowns. I mean, we talked about it earlier. Keys and Wilcox have the traits that the Colts love, but they are legitimately unknowns, and they're on the 53-man roster right away. Uh, where are you at with this cornerback group overall, though, Andrew? I mean, overall, I still think there there are some question marks. I mean, obviously, you're not worried about Kenny Moore. You're no. not worried about Xavier Rhodes, but that outside cornerback spot, it's a big one. And and if if it's not settled or it has inconsistent play, you're going to have quarterbacks that are constantly targeting that, whether it is Rocky Sin or, or TJ Carey. Rocky Sin, again, had an up-and-down training camp. There were points where he looked like a like a legitimate starter in this league. There were other times where you look like you look at him and you're like, that that's not going to work. No. And, and and when TJ Carey was out there, he was the one that was taking those starting reps at the outside corner spot. And then that injury to his knee kind of puts him back a little bit. I still think Rock now starts the season, but it's definitely not set in stone. TJ Carey came back to practice today, and I think he can push Rock for playing time. The Marvel Tell, the Marvel Tell cut, I really think this the Colts didn't see enough. And and one of the things too, Marvel Tell really doesn't play a huge important role on special teams. And when you're thinking, again, we're going to talk about this every single year, especially when a Chris Ballard team, these last roster spots come down to guys that they can contribute on their side of the ball, but also contribute on special teams. So you look at Isaiah Rogers. Isaiah Rogers is a phenomenal kick return guy, and, and he showed some playmaking in training camp at yeah. corner too. So you like his upside. And then you bring in a guy like Bo Pete Keys. He's a guy that's really that plays special teams. Well, he's very, very raw, a seventh round pick. He's a guy that, like you said, has the traits to Colts covet, just like Marvell Tell. And then when you add that special teams element that Marvell Tell doesn't necessarily bring, that's probably going to give him the edge. And so that's why I think they they cut ties with with Marvell Tell. And and it's it is tough to see anytime you have a guy there for multiple years, especially in his situation where whether whether he's going to admit it or not him opting out last year probably played a role in his development and it's just mm-hmm. not being out there not be having that game experience and and that's going to put you behind a little bit and and it, it showed this preseason so there are still questions and you hope one of these young guys or a veteran like TJ Carey can step up and really solidify that outside corner position otherwise i think that's really the weak link of this defense yeah, Keys is is really really intriguing. Six one two zero two special teams player, uh, but he just he has that length and physicality that that the Colts like, and reminds me a lot of of you know maybe a late Minnesota career Xavier Rhodes. Just some of the tape I've watched, so that interest makes sense. Uh, Chris Wilcox, I watched quite a bit uh, at BYU the last few years. Not a great athlete, but again, length, instincts. Uh, so it, it makes sense, but it's it's just really hard to see a guy like Marvell Tell, the guy that they invested in, can play you know boundary corner, some slot, some safety. To see him cut, you know, so soon after returning, and an interesting fact: all three players that sat out last year, opted out, excuse me, mm-hmm. were cut: Sky Moore, Roland Milligan, Marvell Tell the third. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. I don't want to read too much into that. I just found it very interesting that all three guys that opted out last year are no longer with the Colts. Um, So I'm a little, just a little concerned with depth. And that's mainly because I don't know enough about Bo Pete keys and Chris Wilcox. However, Colts fans and Andrew and myself, the great Zach Hicks will come to the rescue (laughs) tomorrow morning uh, with in-depth film pieces on Bo Pete keys and, Chris Wilcox. And I can tell you, I don't think I've ever seen Zach so excited on Twitter um, until Bo Pete Keys as a Colt came across the timeline. Uh, I'd never seen him act like that other than <laughs> when a kicker is cut or whatever. But, uh, right. you know, he, he is ecstatic about Bo Pete Keys. So looking forward to that. Uh, Zach, if you're listening, we, we really enjoy the work that you do. You did an awesome job breaking down Matt Pryor. And uh, I think it's safe to say for both of us on here, we learned so much uh, you know, from Zach in his film rooms each and every time he puts one out. But uh, I want to go to safety here, and that's kind of where it's a little bit of a concern. Jolene Blackman, Kari Willis, George Odom. 
Those are your three safeties right now. There's got to be a corresponding move coming, Andrew, doesn't there? There has to be. You can't oh, yeah. go into week one with three safeties, right? Right, and and that's why Ballard said the roster is still very fluid, and that's that was kind of the shock to me is why Shashere was was cut today is because you only have three other safeties. I mean, you signed Sean Davis, both Sean Davises to the practice squad, but on your active roster, you only have three. And and last year, George Odom hardly even saw the field as a backup safety. He was relegated to just strictly special teams play. Yeah. So there has to be another move coming. The, the Colts that did say that they're going to be looking over these next few days, see what their options are. I'm sure Chris Ballard and his group already have names in mind that they would like to see and like to bring in. So it, it's going to be interesting to see who they add, because if they do add a safety to one of these new cornerbacks, maybe a Chris Wilcox or a Bo Pete Keys, who we're, we're, high, we're high on and want to see, maybe those guys get the boot and end up getting waived. Um, or is it the, the surplus of talent that you have on the defensive line? Or one of those guys, the odd man out. It's going to be interesting to see how these roster numbers shake out because I, I definitely expect a move at safety here within the coming days. I wonder if a guy like Wilcox could be an option to slide back to safety. He's not the greatest athlete. He's got decent size, you know, just under 6'2", 200 pounds. I, I wonder if he profiles better as, as a safety. And, you know, I love mock draftable. I love looking at the spider charts and the comparisons. Two of his top four guys that he compares favorably to on there are safeties. And mm -hmm. one of them, unfortunately, is a guy Colts fans know well, and that's TJ Green. Um, <laughs> but there's another guy on there, Major Wright, who uh, I was a, a huge uh, fan of from a physical standpoint. Uh, so maybe that's a guy that the Colts say, hey, you're going to change positions here. We took a shot on you. We're going to keep you on the 53. You're going to move to safety. You have that cornerback experience. You can play some deep safety type stuff. So mm -hmm. keep an eye on that. But I, I still think there needs to be a move there um, because you can't go into week one with three safeties and one of them didn't play defense at all last year. Right. Uh, so, all right. Now we're going to we're gonna move to our favorite portion. Well, I should say Zach Hicks's favorite portion, the specialists. Uh, <laughs> Luke Rhodes, uh, Rigoberto Sanchez, and Rodrigo Blankenship made the roster. No shock there. Um I got to ask you, though, knowing what this 53-man roster looks like, how do you feel about this team's chances right now? Obviously, the roster is still a fluid situation. Moves can happen. Guys can land on the COVID list. Guys can come off it. You know, Moves are still going to happen. But how do you feel about this team, and what would you project their record to be right now, today, September 1st, just under 830? What would you say they do? I really, I feel, I feel pretty good about it, honestly. And and, I, and we all know, we've said it a hundred times already, COVID's going to affect the season. And uh, it's that's going to be a big, big determining factor as far as our key guys going to be kept out at, at inopportune moments or are we going to be able to skate to go through this? And it's going to be on the Colts and on that team that if they're not vaccinated, they need to follow the protocols to a T, like Chris Ballard said, and, and really be responsible about this. Otherwise, we're going to have another Tennessee situation where DeForest Buckner, oh. Danico Autry, and Jonathan Taylor were all out and the Colts lose at home by 19. So I would say right now, I still think the Colts, in my opinion, they, they would be favored to win the division because okay. I, I I know the Titans made all these moves, and I, I've said this from the beginning. It's going to come down to that final week again with Tennessee and Indy, but I would say right now I'd probably put them at around 11-6. and six. I think that, that that'd be a solid record. I think they can win the division with that, and, and I think they'd be looking at probably about the fourth seed in the AFC with that record. Uh, and it's, again – they can make they can make it to eleven and six. I have full confidence in that. Will they? Because of other circumstances surrounding this team, as far as injuries and 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 COVID protocols and who gets put on what list, we'll have to see. That's that's a beauty of the NFL season. That's why they play the games, as they say. Yeah, I, I have them pegged for right around nine and eight, ten and seven, um, just because of uh, you can do everything by the book. You know, you could follow every protocol. You could still test positive or be a close contact. Um, you know, they say control what you can control and you can do your darndest to control it. I mean, I'm speaking from experience, not to make myself the story, but like when COVID first hit, I followed every recommendation to the T, you know, and, and I still got it. So it, 
I, I just I have a feeling that we're going to see Jacob Eason play and start f- at least four games this year, um, you know, through no fault of Carson Wentz. You know, just regardless if you're vaccinated or not, I, I just think this team's going to get hit hard. I think a lot of teams are going to get hard because it's not just unvaccinated guys that are testing positive. People like DeForest Buckner said yesterday, even the guys on this team that are vaccinated are testing positive. So it's going to be a really challenging year. And unless you have incredible depth, like say the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or, you know, the Kansas city chiefs, like it, it's going to be hard to get through this year and you're going to have to use 85, 90 players. And I just slightly concerned about the Colts depth at, at key positions overall. Uh, but I think we're on the same page record wise. I do think that they could get to like a 12 and five though, if, if, mm-hmm all things break right. And I do think they can push for the division title, but uh, man, just seeing the luck that they've had this summer, no pun intended. We miss you, Andrew luck, but uh, (laughs) you know, the luck that they've had this summer, it's just, it's hard to bet on that horseshoe at this point, which is, which is very, it's just a catch 22, you know, it's supposed to be a, a lucky symbol and there's zero luck at quarterback and on this roster whatsoever. So, um, I want to talk about quickly here before we end tonight's show. Uh, I want to talk about just the practice squad right now. Uh, the Colts announced 15 players signed to the practice squad today, and they are wide receiver Tarek Black, linebacker Curtis Bolton, who was a late summer ad, did a nice job in the final preseason game, defensive tackle Andrew Brown, cornerback Anthony Chesley, defensive end Cameron Klein, veteran safety Sean Davis, rookie safety Sean Davis, tight end Farad Green, Wide receiver to Michael Harris, quarterback Brett Hundley, center Joey Hunt, running back Deion Jackson, linebacker Malik Jefferson, tackle Carter O'Donnell, and wide receiver Tyler Bonds. None of those should have been surprise cuts, uh, although I would like to know where Benny LeMay landed, if he landed anywhere. I have not seen that. Have you seen that news at all? I have not. I think he's still currently a free agent. Okay. So, again, there's 15 names there, Andrew. Uh, the Colts can carry 16. Something's got to happen to fill that spot because Ballard's not going to waste an opportunity to have 16 guys on his practice squad. Uh, I, I don't know what that move could be. Maybe that's sliding. Uh, I, I don't even know how to speculate. I, I would say an offensive lineman like a Will Fries onto the practice squad if Fisher's healthy or – Man, I just I don't know. <laughs> like, how how do you fill that 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 spot? Do you use one of those extra linemen? Like, do you try and sneak an Isaac Rochelle on there? You know, one of those extra defensive linemen, I should say, uh, and plug a hole elsewhere. Do you circle around with Marvell Tell and say, "Hey, come back"? Like, we we want to put more time into you. I don't know what you do at that spot, but you've got to fill it because you cannot waste a practice squad position here in the year 2021 with COVID still running rampant. Yeah. And as of right now, I think it's, it's still reported that the key key, key QT would be that 16th guy. They said there's still some, some things to sign and things to file to the league, but I think that's, who's going to initially take that spot. Now, whether we see QT elevated when, when T Y Hilton goes on IR, if Desmond Patman goes on IR, we'll have to see because the Colts to have him, we'll, we'll have him, I should say, uh, uh, Tarek Black and and some other wide receivers on on this te- on this practice squad already that they could elevate. Yeah. So it, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see what that happens. If Eric Fisher comes back, do you move Will Fries? I could see him going to the practice squad. Will we see one of the Sean Davises end up getting elevated to be a fourth safety? You yeah, know, it's that the roster being fluid is probably the truest thing that Chris Ballard could say because we're gonna we're gonna wrap up this podcast. And with it with tomorrow, there's going to be three or four other moves that this Colts team is going to make. So that things definitely are not settled, especially with all these guys coming back from the COVID list. It, it could be it could be on Monday, Monday or Tuesday of next week before we actually get a firm look at who is going to be suiting up against Seattle week one. Yeah, I, I have to assume that and I know I'm pronouncing his name wrong, but Andre's uh, Shasari. I'm probably, I, it's just Shashare. There we go. Uh, horrendous <laughs> name to pronounce. What, what is going on? But I, I think he's got to circle back at some point, whether it's on the 53 or on the practice squad, he's got to circle back. You can't let that mm-hmm. guy get away uh, in a roster crunch after the mm-hmm. summer he had. Um, yeah. I mean, Kiki QT, what happens there? Isaiah Kalfusi is still out there. He had a heck of a summer. I think you'd like to bring him back. 
it, it's it's very 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 fluid and and you got to do something uh, you know i mean you, you really got to do something you got to add another lineman in my opinion joey hunt and carter o'donnell just isn't enough uh from my standpoint considering the injuries that they dealt with up front already this summer um you know some of the linemen being on the COVID 19 list already i think you got to add a third lineman in there uh, and maybe that's a matt Pryor shifting over to the practice squad or a will fries once eric fisher comes back but uh I don't feel great about this practice squad group right now. I mean, there's obviously some intriguing guys that could be elevated twice in 2021 without any, you know, roster moves needed to be made. Um, but it's not something that I'm like, okay, we're good. Like no matter what, we're good. The, the guy that I feel the best about on this roster uh, on this practice squad roster, honestly, is Andrew Brown. And that's at a position where they're the deepest on the 53. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm glad that they kept uh, Tark Black. I'm glad that they kept him, Michael Harris. You know, Tyler Vaughn's had a had a good summer. I'm glad they kept him. But uh, yeah, I just looking at it, I'm like, it, it, it's okay. I mean, a practice squad isn't going to be great. They're practice squad guys for a reason. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just it, it's it's okay in my opinion. So where are you where are you at with the practice squad just in terms of depth? Yeah, I think I, I think I'm in that boat as well. It, nothing, it's not impressive by any means, but I, I don't think it's the worst in the league by right. far. I think they have good quality quality depth on there. I mean, like you said, Andrew Brown. I think, I mean, both Sean Davis's. You, you could you could do a lot worse than that oh, as as your safety. Um, and then at that receiver, there are some young, intriguing names, especially especially to Michael Harris. I mean, we Kiki QT. Obviously, we've talked about him, but to Michael Harris last year, I mean, he can come in and be a gadget guy. He he can fill in, do some special teams work. He he has a skill set that the Colts really like to see. Uh, Malik Jefferson, we we talked about. That. If one of the uh, linebackers goes down, Malik Jefferson is a guy that fits the mold of a of a Chris Ballard and a Colts Matt Eberflus linebacker. He yeah. can come in very. He's a very fast guy. Can cover ground quickly. So there are certain guys at, at spots that that you would say can fill in in a pinch or if they need to be elevated at the last minute you're comfortable doing that for them to play a special teams or a backup role uh and then i honestly like that joey hunt came back because joey hunt is the will be a or can be your third emergency yeah. center like he has been since danny pinter was hurt and so jo- having joey hunt there is is good but yeah this 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 practice squad is definitely going to change very quickly all throughout the year, oh, yeah. depending on who is needed week to week. So, but, but as right now, I, I, I I'm not overhyped about it, but I'm comfortable with the practice squad. I, I also, I don't want to overlook this because I think it's very important. It probably gives the Colts some really good depth and, and probably better off than other teams is having a guy at quarterback like Brent Hundley, <laughs> 18 career games in the NFL, nine career starts. Find me a practice squad quarterback that has that type of experience uh, around the league, especially in the last two years with guys dealing with COVID. I mean, obviously, I think it was – was it the Eagles or was it the – I think it was the Texans had Josh McCown last year as a mm-hmm. practice squad guy. Is that what it was? Um, so uh, you you have this guy that's going to know the system, can step in if needed, Um, that's huge because mostly practice squad guys, a handful of snaps here or there, or rookies Mm -hmm. are trying to stash. Brett Hudley's done it. He's three Mm -hmm. and six as a starter. You know, his numbers aren't great, but he's been under the lights. He's been under the microscope. He knows how to play quarterback in the NFL. And and that, that, that has me feeling a little bit better. So, Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's nothing, nothing to write home about. I mean, anytime you can have a safety in Sean Davis, who has 50 career games or 50 career starts in the NFL, on the practice squad. Like that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, they've got some good vets. They've got a lot of young, intriguing guys. Uh, Super happy. They kept Deion Jackson. Uh, That that's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, The Michael Harris, you know, a a guy with experience, a little bit of a gadget receiver, but uh, there's some intriguing pieces, but it's not one that you're like, yeah, okay. That guy, if he's elevated, he can handle a starting role or, you know, right. So, uh, but yeah, it's a it's a fluid situation. It's going to be fluid all weekend, all all next week leading up to week one against the Seattle Seahawks at Lucas Oil Stadium. Andrew, we don't have any questions tonight. I think uh, people are just a little overwhelmed with all the moves that are happening <laughs> and trying to catch up. So uh, we may try and hit this again tomorrow night. Um, 
But uh, yeah, that's that's all we have for tonight. Surely appreciate you stepping in for us here tonight, Andrew. Hopefully we've got some big news for you uh, coming here in the next week or so over at Horseshoe Huddle. But uh, yeah, thank you all for tuning in, all that tuned in live and uh, sent comments. Kyle Stewart, you are a huge supporter. Really appreciate you, man. Uh, but that's going to do it for the special Wednesday night edition of the Horseshoe Huddle on Sports Illustrated podcast. For Andrew, I'm Josh. Checking out. Go Colts. <laughs>